Greetings to my fellow Peace Blunderers and today I'm addressing an issue that is a big pain in the ass for a lot of people and that is punishing that annoying bean ketchup structure. I am sure that you've had a bunch of these positions before where your opponent bean ketchups their bishop on the king's side like so and at first their bishop seems absolutely pointless. It's blocked by its own knights, by its own pawns and you're just laughing at it hysterically, you can't stop it because the bishop seems absolutely useless. But as the game progresses, the pawns move or get captured, the knight moves away, and then suddenly, in about 10 or 15 moves, that bishop becomes a monster, and maybe even blunder a pawn on b2 or your rook on a1 because of that, and then you start crying, bloody hell, this bishop was there all the time, and it was terrible. Why did it become so good, and why is it even legal to feed and care to your bishop like that? It's ridiculous. Why can't you develop your bishop like a normal person? Why can't you go c5, d6, b4, any of those, yg7? Ah! And if you wouldn't really mind how to get some tips, on how to play against this monstrosity, this video is for you. I'd like to start with the fact that there are a lot of different Fiend Ketchup positions with different principles, with different ideas. For example, if we go to this one, which is a typical King's Indian, in the Petrosian, where the center is a little bit blocked off, we can see that we've got the Fiend Ketchup structure, of course, for black. And in this position, the typical idea for white is to play a3, b3, and push on the queen side and play on the queen side. Not playing necessarily directly against the fiend catcher structure. The king side is going to be black's playground, as black is going to try and push for maybe a five at some point. At the same time, there are positions like this one, for example, that arose from the peers' defense. And this one is also quite straightforward. White wants to castle queenside and then just ruthlessly and relentlessly push everything on the king's side. And there are prerequisites also to that because both bishops and this queen and bishop battery, the rook, the knight are all staring at the king's side. So it's quite natural to start pushing for g4, h4, etc, etc. Or there are some crazy positions like this one, for example, where white never castled and managed to push some of the kingside pawns already, whereas black is dominating the queenside and would really like to achieve some progress there. And it is in a position like this one where you may be undecided as to what to do next. For example, you could argue, well, we've also got some pieces of our own staring at the queenside. We've also got both knights there. I've got the queen looking over there. So I'm not sure with the bishop situated like that and with my knight situated like that, which side of the board I'm supposed to play on. After all, if I start pushing my king side pawns forward and start attacking directly, my king could get really exposed. So all I want to say before we look into the actual positions is that when trying to punish the fiend ketchup structure, you don't always want to go and attack the structure itself. Don't be blindly obsessed by this just one idea. Ah, oh, I see a fiend ketchup, so I must push. Do what the position dictates you to do. For example, if you go back to the king's Indian, of course, if you play d4 and you see the king's Indian relatively often, as you should, you will know that your plan here is to go a3 and b3 and play on the queen side. So it's not always about direct attack on that structure. Coming back to this position, first we need to understand, answer the question that I posed myself a bit earlier, whether we need to play on the queen side or on the king side, because to a untrained eye, it may not necessarily be obvious at first glance. We ask ourselves two questions. One, is there any sharp, dangerous plan for black on the queen side that I need to stop immediately? Hence, I would have had to play on the queen side to stop it. And two, is there any dangerous plan that I can employ that is going to be better and more reasonable than the actual attacking of the king side? So answering question number one, does black have anything? And at first glance, black doesn't really have too much. The only active plan I can think of is pushing the b-pawn, b5, b4, but it's not particularly convincing. And do we have any amazing 
attacking opportunities on the queen side that would dissuade us from playing an attack on the king side? I don't really think so. First of all, we must look for pawn pushers, and both b3 and b4 are impossible. Well, they're possible, they're just nonsensical. If we play b3, of course, the knight is hanging. <laughs> if we play b4, they can just say Ampasal and the knight is hanging yet again. And if we deal with the knight problem, this pawn may become unstoppable. So it's not really good for us. And do we have any amazing peace activity that would justify a queenside onslaught? Well, we do have knight c4 attacking the queen and the pawn at the same time. So it does look good. But after queen c7, getting the queen away, of course, and defending the pawn at the same time. Oh, what else is there to do for us? We can play rook c1, trying to oppose the queen. but black now has a say on the position with b5. b5 is not hanging, of course, is defended. And now this knight has to go back to d2. And after the sequence of moves, it feels like black is the one who actually achieved something, not us. So again, we do not have an urgency to ferociously defend the queen side, nor do we have any fantastic attacking chances. That's why we should always be leaning towards the attack on the king's side. And perhaps at this moment you'd be like, oh boy, finally the good stuff. Finally something exciting. Stop with the bloody strategical pawn pushing nonsense. I came here for the attack, right? Whereas in my opinion, the more important part of this video is actually the one that just happened already. I think that attacking the Fienketo structure is quite straightforward. Like a lot of people know more or less what to do. It's all about the decision making for me before we attack, whether we actually need to attack or not. Sometimes there are these positions where you go after g4, h4, h5 and lose terribly because this was just not the plan to go for. But, you know, it's quite easy to figure out how to attack the structure because we've got a clear target on g6 to put pressure on. And we're going to do that by pushing the h pawn forward trying to ask questions of that pawn on g6. In this case we have the rook supporting the h pawn and we will not always have that luxury but what we need to understand is even if the rook does not support the pawn sometimes you know when we castle king side our king ends up on g1 and the rook ends up on f1 this is still okay. You can still push the h pawn, it just can be supported by other pieces or even the g pawn. Our end goal is that we want to push this pawn forward enough so that we take the pawn on g6 and whichever pawn recaptures, we will have achieved two things. First of all, we will get the semi open file to play with, and second, we, by our opponent capturing with either pawn, will make their structure weaker. G6 will then be defended not by two pawns anymore, but just one. So let's finally start our attack with H4. Remember that the G4 pawn is defended. Of course, it's attacked twice and is defended twice. And when pushing your H pawn, please make sure that if your G pawn has been pushed before that, that it's sufficiently defended. Because sometimes we blunder these things. Now, H3 supports G4. Now it doesn't, and sometimes it results in a loss of a pawn. So from black we get b5, again probably their only active plan on the queen side, and we are pushing forward with h5. g6 is now under pressure. And what you may see very often from black here is that they will try to move the f rook away from the king, something like rook f to b8, and this position also has a double meaning. They want to of course, give the king some breathing space just in case because they feel like the position is about to get really hot in there. And second of all, in this position, it makes extra bit of sense because they want to support the b4 push. And this is where we come to an interesting point. This is where we need to decide whether to capture on g6 now or to play g5, which we are allowed to do. If we capture immediately, the slight problem is that after captures with the h pawn, the knight can jump into h7 and be a relatively annoying defender. We don't want an extra piece next to our opponent's king to help defend. It's not particularly optimal. But if we play g5 first in this position, the knight doesn't have 
the h7 square to jump to so the knight will probably have to go back to e8 and if you're thinking well can the knight capture on h5 perhaps well it can but after bishop takes pawn takes i don't really fancy black's position after queen takes and we got what we wanted we got the semi-open file and on top of that we got a queen and rook battery so this is why we'll be advised to play g5 first so that the knight goes to e8 which it does and now we capture h takes g h takes g and in most positions from black's perspective taking with the h pawn is going to be better than taking with the f pawn i would say you know don't judge me if i get it wrong but from my experience from my feeling about 70 to 80 percent of the cases black wants to take the g pawn with the h pawn not with the f pawn for a number of reasons usually when you take with the f pawn you weaken whatever is on the e file namely the pawn which may or may not be standing on e6 it's not there right now but if it did if we take with the f pawn the pawn on e6 is undefended on top of that when we do take with the f pawn and let's actually do that so it's easier for you guys to say we immediately open up this diagonal to our king and this usually means no good even in this position it doesn't really save the black skin we can at some point play something like bishop g4 and then place our queen on f3 put it on h3 and then start bombarding this pawn so it's not really much of a savior so again h takes g and we should be pretty happy now with the position we've got the open file to attack with however it doesn't look like this position has a killing blow in it just yet it doesn't look like we can win in the next couple of moves at the same time this pawn being supported by the rook on b8 can become more and more annoying as the game progresses so it's a very good when in the middle of your attack you sometimes stop to think which is very important and check what black is doing on the other side and if you see that you have time and you have resources to maybe put some spanner in black's works sometimes it's better to do that rather than go and mindlessly attack for example in this position the best move that the engine suggests is knight a2 a very subtle interesting move we've been doing everything on the king's side but without having any quick finishing attack with some checks or captures we just decided to take a breather regroup a little bit and just place the knight on a2 so that first of all it's not hanging should this b pawn go away and second of all it does make b4 quite difficult to play now like if b4 just knight takes <laughs> so with one simple move very prophylactic one we basically stopped the entire black's counterplay and we can now continue putting pressure on the king side <laughs> and what are the black pieces supposed to do now you've just ruined their party with one simple move the best course of action the engine suggests is to transfer this knight which is objectively quite miserable on e8 to a6 so it can finally support the b4 push but it's going to be quite slow of course but what are you supposed to do so knight c7 and we are going to play king g2 also a very common maneuver in these positions whenever you open up the h file you want to move your king forward it's a bit more difficult to do if your king is castled and the pawns are all there sometimes you may want to preface it with g3 to play king g2 also making sure that the light square diagonal is safe of course but yeah king g2 is very common we now open up the space for rook to go up to do a rook left and then create a battery it looks very nice knight seven to a6 black is desperately trying to get at least some progress going and we are delivering the rook left rook to h4 there isn't really much of a difference i think between h2 and h4 the only one is that just in case the rook is defending the pawn on e4 that's i think the major difference and now black pieces finally get to play b4 having worked for it for seems like an eternity it's been nine moves since the start of the position they finally got their only active plan which isn't even a plan really we simply can now play 
queen h1 creating that battery and black's position isn't looking very good and now b takes a three for black which is objectively not the best move but even the ones that are better are not really that good it's just that b takes a three is very organic in the position this is something that black has been working for for 10 moves in a row pretty much so it only is fitting that they're going to play that we are going to respond very simply with rook h7 and we have a very interesting tactical idea here remember that when we've got the pawn on g5 like this supporting f6 and h6 there are always tricks with rook sacrifices like i'm about to show you even if a takes b2 very scary we can always finish the game in style with rook takes g7 like so because king takes if king takes we can simply deliver mate very soon with queen h6 check he's got nowhere to go other than to g8 and we're going to transfer rook here to h1 and mate is inevitable now going back a little before we created our deadly battery when we just played rook to h4 if instead of going for b4 for black the king decided to run away with king f8 remember that whenever they play king f8 usually they concede the control over the very important h7 square that's why we can play the beautiful rook to h7 and what is the black king supposed to do now cannot really go any further away because the bishop is just hanging so that's not very good and if now black decides to proceed with b4 leaving the situation on the king side as it is we actually transpose into the position that we just saw with queen h1 and that sort of reminds you of something and now if they play b takes a3 we can always take and the the position is going to be the same after takes we've seen that before right queen h6 check king goes there rook goes that looks like mate so yeah push your h pawn whether protected by a rook or some other pieces or pawns make sure that you don't blunder any pawns that are being pushed forward i.e the g pawn the h pawn if you can get to play g5 that is going to be absolutely brilliant because g5 is controlling a lot of beautiful squares sometimes you will have to play something like king g2 to make space for your pieces to create deadly batteries and be ready for all kinds of sacrifices the one that i showed with the rook taking the bishop is just one type sometimes you want to do cleavance sacrifices to clear the path for your other rook to slide in you may sometimes want to take with the rook or even with the queen on a square like h7 to deliver check or mate with another rook coming in with tempo and if you want to know how to play these clear and sacrifices check out the video that i did it's a very good one and yeah this is how you disrespect the fin ketsu structure but again i think the root of all evil when you play against the fin ketsu is that sometimes you really want to go for it and sometimes it's really not the best thing to do in this position it was the best thing to do but we only figured it out after careful analysis we didn't just go for it we looked at the potential threats and risks and opportunities on the queen side and only then we concluded okay king side is the way to go and i think this is what a lot of people miss when they explain what to do against the fiend ketu. they just say ah push the pawns forward attack being ketu is weak it's gonna fall apart like what well, come on you can't always do that sometimes you're gonna lose very very terribly because you've overextended yourself you've taken way too many risks where you shouldn't have and yeah you just don't feel very good afterwards so yeah if you just so happened to find this video useful please like and subscribe follow me on twitch i stream wednesdays fridays and sundays find me on chess.com join our discord all that good stuff and i'm going to talk to you very soon my favorite unintentional gambit is love you all see you in the next one